I don't want to take up precious time, but it's lovely to have Lee here and to uh, I know you I know if you haven't heard him speak before, you will enjoy what he will have to say. Uh, I had the good fortune of meeting him in Marlborough uh, back in the summertime on a very, very wet day. Um, Wildfell, the book that uh, won the Richard Jeffries Prize last year, really impressed us by the fascinating account that it gives of um, the work that Lee and his colleagues have been doing uh, in on a hill farm in the Lake District. Um, gives a real sense of the, the challenges, um, the difficulties, the successes, the frustrations, um, and the whole thing <laughs> informed by the writer's passion and commitment and knowledge and complete investment in what he's doing. Um, Lee, I'm not going to take up any more of your time. I just welcome you and thank you for giving us your time this evening and looking forward now to hearing what you have to say. <clears throat> very, it's very kind of you. Um, yeah, and thanks all for joining. Um, so I will just share my screen. Let's not let me do it. Hang on. Okay. Can you see the right bit there? The uh, yeah the slides rather than my notes. Yes, that's good. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, so if I just before I start, if, if I could ask all of you to uh, mute your microphones, that would be much appreciated. Um, right, yeah. So um, as Barry said, I'm the I'm, I'm Lee Schofield. I'm the site manager for the RSPB um, at Horsewater. Uh, still, it's still a couple of years after the book's been published. It still feels like a bit of a weird novelty to to also introduce myself as an author. Um, I never really expected to. Um, uh to to have written a book um but apparently i seem to have done so so um for the next sort of 40 minutes or so i'm going to talk to you about the story of Hawes water which is also uh the story of the book and touch on the the ecological work that we're doing but also some of the sort of personal and political challenges that are involved in doing the sort of work that we're doing so Hawes water is a pretty spectacular place um, so it seems to make sense to start the talk with with a view, a little bit of a, a glimpse of what some of it looks like. Um, so this is a view from the southwest corner of Riggendale, um, which is a really significant, uh, really important part of the, the site that we're looking after. And from this vantage point, um, you can pretty much everything that you can see in that vista, apart from the, the very far horizon, obviously, is is part of the, the Hawes Water reserve um that big lump of land on the far side of the reservoir there um that's mardell common and, and nadal forest the lovely sort of wooded hill that you can see sticking out to the left hand side and looking at this view makes me feel a whole range of of different emotions so like the 20 million or so visitors that come to the lake district every year um i absolutely share the um the the, the glory of this place you know i, I revel in the the splendor of it and the the winding rivers and the deep glacial lakes and the soaring fells and all of that that drama that the lake district has this is also a view that makes me feel a huge sense of responsibility because the decisions that my colleagues and i are making um the work that we're doing will influence how nature fares in in you know almost all of the land that you can see in that photo the trees that we're planting the the flowers that we're hoping to encourage, um, you know, they will they will grow on and, and reproduce and they will colour that landscape for a very long period of time, long after I'm working there and, and any of our colleagues are too. This is a view that makes me feel a huge sense of privilege too. To be able to say that that is my office um, is something that, you know, I never take for granted. I take what I'm doing at Horsewater incredibly seriously as do all of my colleagues and all the volunteers that that come and help us out at Hall's Water. So, um, you know, I, I count myself incredibly lucky to be doing the job that I'm doing. But looking at this view, um, it also makes me feel a bit sad because the more I've come to learn about Hall's Water and the uplands of the UK in general, the more I've come to realise just how much is missing. And it would be fair to say that really this is a, a landscape that's full of holes. If I were to have stood in the same place um, seven or eight years ago, um, there's a reasonable chance that I might have caught sight of England's very last golden eagle. Um, 
the reason that Rigendale is such a sort of famous place in natural history circles is that it was the home to England's last golden eagles for a period of about 45 years. So England was completely without breeding golden eagles for a period about, of about 170 years. They were exterminated through the um, the, the sort of uh, the, the Victorian desire to um, kill anything with hooked hook beak and, and claws in order to boost the numbers of game birds. And so golden eagles had really suffered and their population had just completely vanished from England. They held on in Scotland in some of the sort of remotest, wildest places. And then in the sort of early part of the 20th century, as um, forestry plantations were put in across a lot of the Scottish borders, Dumfries and Galloway, um, golden eagles managed to get a toehold back in that landscape again. Young forestry plantations are actually pretty good for golden eagles. They provide quite a lot of ground game, lots of rabbits. Um, because they're not farmed, there's more vegetation. So before those plantations close up, there's lots of things for golden eagles to eat. And as a result of that, their numbers started to, to build up through the sort of 30s, 40s and 50s. And eventually their numbers built up so much that they started to spill over the border back into England again. Partly that was driven because those forestry plantations were starting to close up. So they were, they were starting to offer a lot less to golden eagles. So they were being pushed south um, and a few birds started to appear in the sort of 60s. And then in 1969, a very um, significant event in or ornithological circles, a, a nest was built on Heart of Fell. And the first golden eagle egg that, the, that England had seen in 170 years was laid in this nest on Heart of Fell, which is the big crag that overlooks um, the small car park at the end of the reservoir. Unfortunately, probably due to the proximity to that car park, um, those golden eagles abandoned that nest and that egg that was within it. Um, and they moved around into Rigendale, which is just around the corner. And there they were to have more success. They held on to that territory for a period of 45 years. There's five, five birds in a sort of little lineage, if you like, as one half of the pair died. Another would drift down from Scotland to take its place. The last bird of that, of that, um, th that little group uh, was a male. Um, he was paired briefly with the second female, who was the oldest living golden eagle ever recorded in the wild. She lived 30 years and he was paired with her for a couple of years before she passed away of old age. By that point, the population in southern Scotland had really dwindled almost to almost to nothing. Um, and so even though our last male eagle displayed every bit as vigorously as as any other golden eagle had done um, in, in the valley previously, he failed to pull in another mate just because there weren't enough birds in the system by that point. And so each year he would do this display. They have this amazing kind of undulating display flight in the hope that another female would join him. And then he didn't give up on that territory. Golden Eagles, once they settle on a territory, they, they you know, they hold on to it. Um, and for 12 years, he did that with 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 no female having come to um, come to join him. And then in 2015, um, during the winter where we had Storm Desmond and a, and a succession of really extreme storms, we suspect by that point he was probably about 20 years old, which is kind of the average life expectancy for wild golden eagle. We think that the combination of his old age, perhaps being a bit depressed because he hadn't had a mate for 12 years, um, and that period of extreme weather meant that he probably just just struggled to hunt during that during that winter and probably just starved to death. We'll never know for sure, of Ooh, course, but that seems the most likely outcome. And so at that point, England became golden eagleless all over again. And I think the fact that the entire British countryside, the entire English countryside, I should say, is incapable of supporting even a single golden eagle is a pretty damning indictment of how we've been looking after the place. And so this is um, an interesting view. This is looking over into Rigendale from the other side of the reservoir. Um, and the interesting thing I think about this picture is that there are lots of, of signs that have been left behind of species that are no longer with us. So in Rigendale, um, right sort of to the centre of the, the ridge that you can see um, disappearing into the cloud there, there is a there is an eagle crag. Um, and that eagle crag wasn't named for our recent, um, you know, re-colonists, if you like. Um, that was named Eagle Crag a very long time ago. So that site that was used by our golden eagles more recently had been used by them going well back into the past as well. Um, the reason it was named Eagle Crag was probably to signpost people to that as a place that they could go and steal the eggs and try to exterminate them or potentially to warn people against 
um, you know, taking their sheep anywhere near them for fear that they, you know, the eagles might take the lambs. A little bit further down the ridge, there is a heron crag. And any of you who know anything about birds will probably know that herons don't typically nest on crags. They normally nest in trees near to water. Um, and in this instance, heron is actually a derivation of the old English word urn for white-tailed eagle. Um, and there are lots and lots of heron crags, as well as iron crags, not anywhere near iron mining areas. Um, and there are one or two urn crags as well in the lakes. Um, so those were very likely to be white-tailed eagle breeding sites. Um, and they disappeared around about the same time as the golden eagles did. Um, they have yet to return, but um, they are obviously making a comeback in other parts of, of um, the UK as a result of reintroduction. So, you know, it's not beyond the realm of possibility that, that, got, that white-tailed eagles might start to breed in the Lake District once again. But the most conspicuous thing in this photograph is this little stone building in the foreground. And this is a building called High Loop, L-O-U-P. Um, any Latin scholars in the in the um, audience will probably recognize that as being related to lupine, as in wolf. Indeed, it is the same word that the French still use for wolf, le, le loup. Um, and so wolves were here um, and they have left their marks all over the landscape. So high and low loop, which is a little pair of, of, of kind of ruined cottages, probably has have their origins at a time when wolves were still around. Perhaps not this building, but one um, that was recycled from from you know um, a building that, that this this building is probably built from stones of an older building that was there. And if, if you ratch around in the bracken around that area, you'll see there's quite a there was obviously quite a, a little settlement there at some point. And these buildings were probably built for people to live in while they looked after their livestock up on the fell. And if people were to turn their livestock out when wolves were still around, they were taking a massive risk. So just like people still do in the Alps and many other mountainous regions in Europe and across the world, living alongside your livestock with dogs to protect them from predators is is essential in order to kind of maintain, um, you know, to keep those livestock alive, basically. Um, so the wolves disappeared from Cumbria in around the sort of end of the 13th century. Um, and I think it's really interesting to consider that the farming practices of the Lake District really have their origins at that time when predators and sort of transhumans and living with the livestock was an absolutely necessary. It was it was it was an absolute necessity. Um, and today, obviously, those predators are gone, but we still see the shadows of um, those sorts of practices in the modern hill farming practices that are there today with with hefting and people moving up to the hill with dogs um albeit now just for very short periods and heading back down again so i think you know wolves were part of the development of that farming culture that we have in the lake district today which is so celebrated through the lake district's designation as a world heritage site and there's lots of other species that are missing and i promise i will move on to slightly less gloomy topics um, before the end of the talk um we've lost um, pine martins, there are marked crags all over the place. We've lost wildcats, there are kit crags all over the place. And, and indeed, the Lake District was famed for having a very large, robust population of wildcats, which we now refer to as Scottish wildcats. They weren't Scottish all that long ago. It's just that Scotland is the last place that they've managed to cling on to. Uh, we've lost red kites mostly, though they are starting to return again. Um, there are places called Wild Boar Fell and Grisdale, which have their origins from when wild boar was still present. But the species that has vanished most recently is the one that's shown in this picture, an absolutely stunning bird, um, the black grouse. And they were present in the Lake District until around about the 80s or 90s. And the last place that they hung on until um, hung on in were, was the sort of eastern Lake District. So Horsewater, Long Sleddle, Kentmere, that part of the world. Um, and there are black grouse place names just all over the map for the Lake District. There's a farm shop just down the road from where I live called Cock Lakes. Um, and that comes from Cock Lek, Black Cock Lek. And so black grouse have this amazing um, sort of ritualized display that they do. They have this sort of weird bubbling, trilling call. They sort of hiss at each other and the males strut all pumped up to try to impress the females that sort of hide away in the grass around a sort of um, sort of boxing ring, if you like. One of the reasons that we don't have black grouse is that they were a, a, a sort of a quarry species and that sort of hunting um, kind of slightly fell out of favour and the gamekeeping that was associated with it to keep the predators under control, that that sort of fell away. Um, 
but the the main reason that we don't have them is that black grouse are a really really fussy bird so they need um heathland they need bog they need young regenerating woodland um and they need areas of short grassland to lek so they need that whole habitat mosaic to be intact in order to get everything they need for the different parts of their lives um and although we have all of those ingredients in the lake district we have all those bits generally speaking they are quite fragmented from each other so we have bits of wonderful woodland but they're generally in very small pockets a long way from from other areas of woodland and generally speaking they're not able to naturally regenerate because there's been very high levels of deer um, and sheep grazing for a very long period of time so black grouse are starting to make a bit of a tentative return to our part of the world there's been quite a number of sightings of black grouse just recently um, and if we can get them to to stay if we can get them to breed then that will be a real sign um that the lake district landscape is is turning a corner and is is starting to offer a lot more to to black grouse and and all of the other species that benefit from that healthy habitat mosaic so many of those species that were here until you know relatively recently in some cases have 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 disappeared and and partly that's because we've actively eradicated them, hunted them because they were seen to be sort of competitors or, or predators of our livestock. But mainly the reason that we've lost many species is because we've significantly changed the habitat of the Lake District landscape. When visitors come to the lakes in any upland region, you know, change happens really quite slowly. And so it's quite hard to comprehend that these are dynamic places. You know, they are places that are constantly undergoing a tussle between natural succession and grazing and the climate is having an impact and plants are growing and dying and all of all of those biological processes are happening all of the time. But because those changes happen so slowly, I think a lot of people are under the misapprehension that these places are are as they've always been and as they should be. And and really that's not that's not the case at all. And and it doesn't take long before um, you get the, you know, once you, if you work in conservation, particularly, you start to be able to read the landscape and understand how much has changed and, you know, how much the landscape could change again if we if we kind of nudged it in a particular direction. And one of the most visible indicators of change um, is bracken. So this is a picture looking over Horswater Reservoir onto Bampton Common, and you can see the bracken there and it's sort of gingery colour. So this is obviously a sort of autumn winter photo. Um, Bracken is effectively a woodland indicator species. It only grows in the places where the soils are sufficiently deep and dry for broadleaf trees to grow. Um, you can see from the photo here that there's no bracken in the very thin soils around those scree beds. If you were to climb up the fell and get onto the top, you'd find that the, the soils there were much peatier and wetter and that, that, that the bracken doesn't grow there either. It can't cope with the windswept conditions of the very fell tops. So it's only growing in those places that 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 are you know good for trees to grow, and in a wild pre-human sort of primordial Lake District landscape, bracken would have actually not been a common plant at all. It's very it's very light demanding, so you only would have had it growing in the sort of woodland glades, and as the ancient woodlands were slowly cleared originally by sort of Neolithic people opening them up for, for sort of early agriculture, the bracken had an opportunity to spread. There was more light all of a sudden, so it expanded its footprint. To a degree, um, bracken was kept in check by people cutting it until fairly recently. You know, it was traditional practice to cut it for bedding or for thatching or for packaging. Um, but it was those practices have largely died out and because farming has shifted away from having a mixture of kind of heavy footed animals like cattle and ponies and pigs which which would rootle the uh the bracken rhizomes up and shifted to a farming system that is dominated by sheep um the bracken has really had its opportunity to spread back to almost its maximum extent and bracken is completely unpalatable for all livestock um it's it's quite toxic if consumed in large quantities it's a nightmare from an access point of view, very difficult to walk through. It supports very, very little in the way of wildlife. So I've increasingly come to think of bracken as an opportunity. It's the places that we should be focusing our tree planting and woodland restoration efforts. And if we just replaced the bracken with woodland and we didn't concentrate anywhere else, we would exceed all of the targets that anybody has set for, for woodland expansion in the Lake District and we would lose nothing in terms of of um you know agricultural value in fact if we planted trees into bracken areas we would probably increase the agricultural value of these places because the trees 
that would be growing would actually provide some sort of fodder value to any livestock um, that, that might be there. So other signs of change that you might come across, you might see um, old sort of withered rows of, of hawthorn showing where hedges used to be and have fallen out of management. You quite often come across shallow depressions in the floodplain showing where rivers used to run. Um, it's pretty rare to come across any area of, of, of peatland, any peat bog that doesn't have some ditches cut into it um, in an effort to try to improve them for, for agricultural use. So everywhere you turn, you can see that there are these signs of change of just how much, um, you know, how heavily we've modified this landscape. You know, it is it, it, these places are as wild as they might feel. Um, they are, you know, a very, very long way from being wild. Um, so some of these signs of change um, can actually be quite useful in terms of um, informing where to target our restoration opportunities. So just like I was saying, the uh, the bracken could be a good indicator of good places to plant trees. Um, with a bit of work, you can find out, you know, what was there previously, and that might make a good opportunity for, for habitat restoration. So when we started at Horswater um, uh, over a decade ago, uh, when we took on the tenancy of two farms, Nadal and Swindale, we did as you would expect the RSPB to do. And we did lots of work surveying and monitoring, um, you know, to understand the populations of, of species that we had on site, what the condition of our habitats were like. But we also tried to look back in time as best we could. Um, and so we did that exercise of reading the landscape, understanding place names. But we were also able to look back at old maps. And there's some fantastic online resources which are which are just actually quite fun to play around with where you can compare um the sort of the earliest detailed maps the sort of first ordnance survey maps which are kind of 1880s with the modern maps and you can see you know what has what has disappeared or or reappeared um during that intervening sort of 150 year period um and in this particular spot which is up on mardell common when we look back at those first maps we could see that there was this little water body um up on the common and it was still there on the sort of 1910 map and it was still there on the 1930 map. By the time we got to the 1960s, all of a sudden that water body wasn't there anymore. And what had almost certainly happened was that um, the, the farmers and um, common graziers in that area had taken advantage of a grant that was being offered by government to try to improve land for agriculture. And they'd cut a, a, a simple drain at the bottom of that little, little tarn um, and let the water away. And when we started up there, it was it was a soggy area, but it didn't really ever have any standing open water. So a few years ago, working with Cumbria Wildlife Trust to do fantastic amount of really brilliant bog restoration work in Cumbria. Um, they were doing some restoration up on Mardell Common and we asked them to to just put a, a sort of a slightly higher than usual dam into that drain that was um, disappearing um, from the bottom of, of the area where that water body used to be. And hey, presto. Um, the, the little tarn reappeared. And it's a real truism in nature conservation that when you add water back into a landscape, when you add water, when you restore a kind of wetland habitat, the wildlife just finds it almost immediately. Any of you who will have created a pond in your garden will know that to be true. It's just incredible how quickly the pond skaters are there and the dragonflies are laying eggs into it and the, the water boatmen are, are, are swimming away. Um, and the same is true when you do that on a larger scale. So walking around this little um, water body on Mardell Common today, um, you know, it is a place that's really teeming with life. In the summer, the dragonflies are busy. Um, there's reed bunting and teal prospecting around the edges of it. It's full of nice emergent flowers like bog bean and, and sort of tall sedges offering cover to a, to a whole range of different, um, different wildlife. So, um, you know, this is a, a, a brilliant, very simple piece of restoration work that I feel um, there is huge opportunity to do much more of across, well, across the whole country, but certainly in the uplands. I was really fortunate to go to Norway on sabbatical a few years ago, and there's a couple of chapters in the book about that. Um, um, there are a number of really quite striking similarities between the uplands of, of southern Norway to the uplands of, of the UK. Um, you know, the wildlife is very similar. The climate is not that dissimilar. Um, the geology is basically identical. Um, but what's very different is that Norway has had about 100 years of rest. Um, it hasn't been farmed anything like as intensively for the last 100 years due to a period of, of rural depopulation that happened from the sort of 1880s onwards. Um, and so their upland landscape is much, much more intact. And as a result, 
um, there is a lot more open water. You know, it was never subject to the kind of intensive drainage efforts that happened in the UK. Um, and so everywhere you go, there is open water. And I suspect that the Lake District Suplands looked somewhat similar to that. And one of the things that we've been trying to do is identify opportunities for where we can restore these wetlands in order to, to breathe more life back into our fells. So a big focus for us at Horswater is, is working with the fragments of habitat that we have that I mentioned. We've got these little bits of good quality habitat, but they're generally um, sort of broken up, isolated from each other within a matrix of really quite poor habitat. Species poor acid grassland is the thing that really dominates um, you know, vast swathes of land in the Lake District for, for reasons I'll explain in just a second. We are really fortunate, though, in that some of the fragments of habitat that we're working with are really quite big. Um, so Nadal Forest, um, which we're looking at in this photo, is probably the second most important block of, of temperate rainforest um, in the Lake District after Borrowdale. It's a lot smaller than Borrowdale, but we've got a couple of hundred hectares of really quite rich ancient woodland, um, you know, rain soaked because of our hyper oceanic climate. As a result, supporting a vast abundance and diversity of, of mosses and uh, lichens and epiphytic plants and ferns, trees with great big rot holes that support things like pine martins and red starts, uh, not pine martins, pied flycatchers, not pine martins yet, one day, um, pied flycatchers and red starts and goosanders, um, you know, a really wonderfully rich habitat, but one that is very limited in extent compared to how it used to be historically. Um, and I think the comparison between the two sides of the reservoir that are shown in this picture is really interesting. The reason that we've got the woodland on the left hand side is really just through a quirk of fate. Nadal Forest was protected as a medieval hunting preserve. So, um, you know, wealthy gentry would would they valued the trees for the cover that they gave to um, quarry species, to deer, to, to wild boar, perhaps the odd unfortunate wolf, if you go back far enough. Whereas on the other side of the reservoir, um, that was land that was given over to um, to farmers, to to common graziers. They were it was a manorial waste, if you like. It was land that was considered of such poor quality that the 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 landowners were prepared to let the peasants do what they wanted with it. Um, and that, as a result, has been grazed quite heavily for a long period of time. So even though trees might occasionally try to grow you know seeds could be blown across the reservoir um they never get the opportunity to grow just simply because there are too many sheep and too many deer on there to allow them to get away so a big focus for us at horsewater is is working with these woodland fragments collecting seeds collecting cuttings growing them on in our nursery um and then and then planting them back out in order to allow these woodlands to expand out into the wider landscape again particularly into the areas that are dominated by brecon Another really important habitat fragment for us is juniper scrub. So we have lots of lots of remnant juniper um, at Horswater. Juniper is a really important species, not least for the you know the cultural value it has in terms of the flavouring it gives to gin. Uh, but it's a really important species for wildlife. Um, species like ring ouzel really rely on juniper. They feed up on the juniper berries in order to fuel their um, autumn migration off to the Atlas Mountains. Um, but juniper, although it is quite a spiny species and therefore with an inbuilt level of um, natural protection from grazing, the, the young seedlings are really quite palatable. They haven't sort of taken on that sort of spiny spininess to them yet. And so, again, that high level of grazing has meant that it's been very difficult for juniper to regenerate. And a lot of the trees that we have are uh, senescent. You know, they are, they are getting old. They're stopping producing as many berries. And obviously the inevitable will happen to them eventually. So we've been growing juniper in our nursery for, for several decades, planting it back out into these areas to, to sort of buffer them and bolster them. Um, and as a result of changes to grazing, we are now starting to see juniper naturally spreading um, throughout the landscape again. But one of the most interesting, fascinating um, and underappreciated habitat fragments um, are ones that are the most difficult to get to for the majority of people. So when you... Um, scramble up into some of the crags around Horswater, um, particularly in the areas that have got a sort of limestone influence in their in their geology. You come across in some places the most spectacular assemblage of plant life that that you know you, you'll ever find in the in the UK. These are effectively um 
alpine meadows so for any of you that have been to the alps or the picos or anywhere like that you know this is a plant community that you might be familiar with it's full of big bulky herb species like angelica and rose root and devil's bit scabious um you know plants that are all really really tasty to any self-respecting sheep or deer and the reason that these plants are still here is simply because they're growing in terrain that is just too difficult for any of those animals to get to and this says an awful lot about the Lake District, you know, the fact that the, this kind of diversity can survive only in the places that are completely inaccessible to most sensible human beings um, and livestock just shows how intensively this whole whole place has been worked. And so I start the book with a little episode um, from uh, one of these places uh, um, up on Heart of Fell. Um, and if OK with you, I'll just uh, read a little section from that to, to set the scene. Three straggly trees huddle on the fissured face of Harter Fell, high in the Lake District's eastern corner. From 30 feet below, I can tell that they're willows, but I need to get closer to work out which species. With plenty of well-rooted birch and rowan to cling to, scrambling up the first part of the flower-hung crag is easy enough. The upper section, a few more degrees to the vertical, is a different matter. A loss of footing now would result in a slide, a plummet, and a limb-breaking landing on the boulder scree below. Few people set foot up here, leaving botanical treasures undiscovered in steep gullies and on brittle ledges. Water, running over the crumbly, calcium-rich rocks, forms patches of fertile, rudimentary soil. Great for flowers, not so great for climbing. Halfway up this slippery mess of a cliff, a solid-looking foot-long triangle of rock comes off in my hand, shattering on the ground below. I retreat with my pulse racing. Working around the base of the crag, I find a gentler ascent by a narrowing, grassy corridor hemmed in by rising cliffs. As usual, my progress is slow, distracted every few steps by the summer wildflowers. Stone bramble, alpine ladies' mantle, northern bed straw, lesser meadow rue and starry saxifrage enliven the rocks, the poetry in their names adding to the allure of their shapes and colours. The willows come back into view, with just a narrow, sloping slab bridging the gap between us, which I inch across crab fashion. I feel as if I'm reaching hallowed ground. Growing beneath the unruly mesh of the willow's branches are the fleshy stems of rose root, the smooth oval leaves of devil's bit scabious, sturdy heather and vivid bilberry, a fragrant feast for any herbivore. That these plants are still here tells me that none have been brave or hungry enough to make the crossing. The soil is light and fluffy with the rich mossy smell of an ancient oak wood. Any boot marks I leave will be quickly colonised, the plants are raising the evidence of my visit. Their glossy green foliage tells me that these are tea leaf willow, a species which grows in only a handful of places in the Lake District fells. No more than shoulder height, their squat and sprawling form keeps them stable on their wind-battered refuge. The promise of such rare and beautiful plants makes botanizing in these crags intensely addictive. There's always one more ledge to investigate, one more unexplored gully with secrets to uncover. I've never made it back to the car anything less than hopelessly late. So like those little fragments of alpine flowers and like the woodlands, I think it's fair to say that farming exists in a similarly fragmented, distorted and transformed state. If we were to go back 100 years um, and visit one of the, the um, Lake District valleys, we'd have found many more farms. We'd have found farms that were smaller, farms that had more people on them. Um, working on them and farms that um, had a much greater diversity of uh, produce so as well as the sheep there would have almost all the farms would have had um, cattle for for milking and for beef uh, they would have had ponies for working they would have had pigs uh, many had goats geese were really common um, as were chickens most would have had little vegetable gardens um, there would have been arable plots for growing winter fodder um, because in a difficult to to access remote part of the world like the Lake District, it makes sense to try to be as close to self-sufficient as you possibly can be. If you want a healthy, varied diet, then you're going to have to grow a broad range of things because it's not straightforward just to to bring produce in. Obviously, much harder to do then than it is today. But a huge came um, a huge change came after the Second World War. Um, there was this concern that if another war were to break out, um, that we would be left very vulnerable if um, sort of supply routes were dis disturbed by by um, you know submarines or or whatever else. So there was this big societal 
push for um, food production, there was this. Um, there was, for the first time, government really started intervening in a big way financially to try to incentivize uh, an increase in yields across across the whole of the uh, across the whole of the country. So those changes happened first of all in the in the lowlands, in the areas that were the most productive, and grants were offered for. Um, ripping out hedgerows to make um, fields larger and more efficient for the new technologies that were coming on stream at the time, the tractors um, for, you know, application of new sprays and fertilizers and pesticides and all of that, um, you know, to all of those incentives, farmers responded incredibly quickly and effectively and yields absolutely soared. It took a little while for the same approach to be applied in the uplands, but there was growing concern that they that the uplands might get left behind they you know they were never going to be able to compete with these sort of now super efficient lowland farms and um government rightly worried that that might lead to um you know rural depopulation and um the fragmentation of rural communities and so um upland specific grants were brought in and they did things like pay for land drainage which i've already mentioned so trying to lower the water table in order to 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 let PT ground grow more grass but the thing that made the biggest difference were um, the headage payments so this was government paying farmers per head of livestock that they could they could carry um, and if you are a farmer you know an economically rational person you're going to respond to that by trying to increase the numbers of stock that you've got as quickly as you possibly can and it's a lot quicker and easier to increase the numbers of sheep um, which would have probably been more numerous to start with anyway um, than say cattle or or pigs or ponies. And because sheep are quite adept at utilizing very poor quality um, forage like that, which is found up in the fells, um, farmers really lent in to, to sheep in a big way. And, and many of those other livestock types um, sort of fell by the wayside. Sheep are not a native species to the UK. So they don't have a native ancestor um they the the ancestors of sheep came from mesopotamia so a very much drier very very different kind of climate to to the lake district cattle pigs and ponies on the other hand they are all native species they've all got native ancestors um and so the plant life the wildlife the ecosystem is much better suited to the grazing um as practiced by cattle pigs and ponies sheep graze in a really different way to those other animals they um, are much much more selective they have small mouths that can pick out the sort of sweeter species within a sward they can they're particularly adept at picking out tree seedlings um, and so as a result that selective grazing has meant that almost everything that's left on the lake district fells are the things that are unpalatable the things that the sheep don't want to eat so coarse grasses rushes and not an awful lot else to be honest and it's that combined with the fact that there were so many of them that has led to a huge loss of wildlife and a huge loss of diversity, particularly plant diversity, which is what invertebrate diversity and all other diversity relies upon, um, that's happened over the course of the last century or so. And so I want to be absolutely clear, and I try to be really clear in this about this in the book, that this is not about any kind of um, accusation against farmers. It's not about a hatred of sheep. Um, the decisions that were made to to intensify farming in the uplands were societal decisions. You know, we were all complicit. It was our taxes that paid for it. And it was believed to be the right thing at the time, you know, that in order to kind of boost food productivity. Um, but we didn't really realize the many negative consequences that would have that would have. And at the moment, we're at a bit of a turning point. We've left the European Union. We're outside of the common agricultural policy. And so there's an opportunity to change how farming is supported how it's funded to try to shift farmers more towards nature recovery and you know away from just thinking about food production food production will always be part of what the lake district does but we need to try to find a way to balance that with lots of other um, very important products like carbon sequestration uh, wildlife habitat improvement and flood risk reduction so we've been given an amazing opportunity at Horswater. Um, 12 years ago, we were given um, the, the chance to take on two farm tenancies from United Utilities, who we work in very close partnership with. They own the whole of the Horswater catchment. And so we've taken on these tenancies that give us management control over around about 3,000 hectares. 
Um, so that's 30 square kilometers. We've got 750 hectares of enclosed land and then um, large areas of common land that are associated with that. And what we want to do at Horsewater, what we're aiming for is, first of all, to learn, to understand how these hill farming systems work from the inside, to understand their economics. And then we started to trial different approaches, do different things that we feel um, would lead to sort of nature recovery. And then um, more latterly, we've moved into a, a sort of sharing uh, demonstration phase, if you like, talking to people about what it is that we've achieved and and how we believe that that can be um, integrated with with other styles of land management and it feels since we've been there that this is you know this is increasingly important work you know the awareness of the threats of climate change and biodiversity loss feels like everybody understands that now then we need to make land work better for us we need to to do as much as we possibly can to try to um you know keep the catastrophe at bay um and we're not suggesting at Horsewater that we've got all the answers. You know, 12 years is not a long period of time, but we do think that we've learned some things um, that can be of wider relevance. However, not everybody is thrilled with what we're doing. Um, the suggestion that somewhere which is as cherished as the Lake District um, may not be perfect um, is not one that that everybody, it's not a message that everybody wants to hear. So we put a lot of time and energy into communicating what we're doing and why we're doing it, and that it can be a really positive thing, both for the landscape, both for, for, for livelihoods, for communities, as well as for wildlife and for the ecosystem. So one of the tools that we found that has been really, really helpful um, in terms of communicating this is, is this series of visualizations that we had commissioned um, a few years ago. So this is our, this is our before picture. Um, it shows the, the the land that we're looking after, obviously in a kind of pictorial um, cartoon kind of fashion. But there's lots and lots of detail built into these images um, that sort of portrays what it is that we're trying to do. So when we took the farm tenancies on, we had a lot of sheep. There were about um, 3000 when we took on tenancies initially. There were lots of deer in the landscape. Uh, we had these big areas of bracken. Um, we had um, our wonderful woodlands, but they were sort of very constrained in the landscape, stopping very abruptly when they reached the boundary between the enclosed land and the common. Up on the left hand side there, you can see we had a very straight river in Swindale and even higher up above that. Again, it might be obscured on your screen, but um, an area of, of, of drained blanket bog. We did still have our golden eagle, but he was all alone. Um, and when we did our surveys up on the fells, we'd find meadow pipits and skylarks and, and not really a great deal else. You can see down in the farmyard there, um, bales wrapped in, in agricultural um, plastic wrap. Um, and you can see quite a lot of erosion when we would contain uh, the 3,000 or so sheep that we had in the yard for clipping or medicating or whatever. Um, you know, they would have a pretty significant um, erosive effect on the land. So as I mentioned earlier, change is something that happens very slowly in the uplands. But this is what we hope the landscape will look like in something like 2050. And we believe that this is a really realistic, credible vision of, of, of what the place will look like. And indeed, lots of the changes that are depicted here um, are things that have already happened. So um, you can see the river has got its its meanders back. And I'm going to touch on that in a, in a little more detail shortly. Um, we've made a big change in grazing. We've moved sheep off of the hill and they only graze now on the enclosed land, which is that much more productive. It can it can sustain them, whereas up on the up on the common. Um, those sheep have been replaced by belted Galloway cattle and a scattering of fell ponies. We've seen um, red grouse return in response to that change in grazing. We've seen much more heather growing and red grouse um, feed on the heather. So, um, you know, their, their numbers are starting to grow on the hill. Um, tree pipits have returned in response to the young um, woodland areas that are being established. We've moved away from having... Um, you know, blocks of woodland and then open fields. We've, we've got many more trees and hedges in, in the enclosed farmland just in order to provide more wildlife habitat, to provide sort of stepping stones, but also to provide more shade and shelter to the livestock, which, you know, really, really benefit from that. So these sort of broad vistas, um, I think, are really useful. And I guess one of the key things to take away from this pair of images that is that this is still a quintessentially rugged beautiful lake district landscape although it's got many more trees in it it's not like they're obscuring the view anywhere um you know you it would be hard to say that this has been a complete transformation and i think that's sometimes what people worry about that um you know 
rewilding or, or ecological restoration, whatever you want to call it, is going to mean that it's going to be trees everywhere and it's going to be completely impenetrable and we're not going to be able to see all those wonderful views that we've been coming to enjoy for, you know, for, for holidays year after year. Um, you know, that is just not how habitats are in the uplands you know because the 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 place is so windswept because the soils are so wet and so thin the trees are always going to be quite scattered and broken up with areas of heathland and grassland so although these big images i think are are quite instructive it's also useful to be able to look in a little bit more detail so this gives you the before and after of bog restoration um and amusingly i've worked with digger drivers that spent the first part of their career creating the picture on the left hand side uh, and the latter part of their career um, creating the picture on the right hand side um, and a huge amount of the left hand side was created as a result of those grants I've already mentioned there was this push to just try to get water away from wetland as quickly as possible to lower the water table cutting in miles and miles and miles of ditches um, sending the water straight off downhill as quickly as possible unfortunately downhill is where all the people live um, so that massively increases the risk of flooding but even more bad news than that is that when you drop the water table and expose peat soil the huge amounts of carbon that are locked up in those peat soils start to react with the oxygen in the atmosphere and vast quantities of carbon dioxide are released so there's more um, carbon locked up in the peatland soils um, in the UK than all of the forests put together um, so although peatland locks up carbon really quite slowly when it's in good condition um, the key thing peatland restoration is that we stop releasing it as quickly as possible so to undo that drainage work is you know technically fairly straightforward you simply block up the drains and you bring the water right back up to the surface again and when the peat is kept wet then it starts to lock in that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere rather than releasing it and we need to do that with huge urgency there is more carbon dioxide released from the degraded peatlands of the uk than all of our transport emissions put together and great strides are being made towards that work, but there's a lot more to do and we need to be we need to be getting on with it as quickly as possible. And it's really rewarding to do peatland restoration. If, if the peatland is not so degraded that it's lost all of its vegetation cover, the special plant life that's adapted to growing peat bogs is able to recover really quite quickly. Sphagnum mosses, um, carnivorous plants like sundews and butterworts, um, uh, the cotton grass, the you know amphibians, the dragonflies, green hair streak butterflies, all of those all of those species, they they do come rushing back in really really quite quickly. Um, so yeah, moving from that left hand picture to that right hand is is something that's happening over really quite large areas at Horswater and the uplands of the UK more generally. But it really is work that can't happen quickly enough. So a similar pair of images for uh, Swindale. So when we took over. Um, the farm tenancies. We inherited a river that had been straightened probably a couple of hundred years beforehand um, for very good reasons. Again, um, you know, the, the the justification for straightening a river in many cases is, was in order to protect hay meadows. Um, farmers living and working up in Swindale were absolutely reliant on those hay meadows. If they couldn't get a good crop of hay cut during the late summer, to feed their livestock over the winter then there was no option for them to nip out and get some from you know across the pennines like people quite often do today so you know it made sense at the time um but times have changed you know we are no longer quite as critically reliant on those hay meadows and what we desperately need is wildlife habitat improvement and more uh, reduction in the risk of flooding for people downstream and so in 2016 working with a whole range of partners um, we put the meanders back into the beck in Swindale and wildlife responded just with incredible speed we had salmon spawning back in that restored reach of the beck within three months of the diggers leaving the site and that was purely because instead of water rushing down through that straightened channel with incredible speed and taking all of the the, the gravel away with it um, the river moving through this meandering channel was picking up bits of gravel here and depositing it there and so you ended up with this much more um, structurally diverse stream bed, including gravel that was small enough for salmon and trout to to sweep to one side to lay their eggs into to make their um, their gravel reds, um, and that change the wildlife responded to. And salmon are a species that are struggling, you know, all over the country, largely due to problems at sea, but also due to a lack of spawning habitat, to a lack of of shade in the watercourses. 
And so to see them respond in that positive way was was hugely encouraging. We still do manage the hay meadows either side. And indeed, we've managed to make hay every year since the river was restored. There is a more natural flooding regime now. The water can get out onto the hay meadows. But because there aren't the levees that were there previously, uh, it can also drain back in again. And so far, you know, we haven't had any negative consequences in terms of the sort of the production of those um, hay meadows um, as a result of doing that river restoration. We now make the hay in a much more traditional way. We, we tend to make small square bales rather than big round ones. The big round ones don't fit into our old stone barns. The small square ones do. And so that means that we don't have to use the black plastic bale wrap anymore. It also means that we need lots more help because the small plastic bales have to be stacked by hand rather than um, with a tractor like the round bales are. And so um, we're, you know, we're hugely lucky. We have loads of amazing volunteers that come and help us. And so haymaking is becoming a kind of community activity again, which is what haymaking always was. So it's it's hugely satisfying, actually, to be, you know, carrying on that legacy for the people um, from the people that, that, you know, have lived and worked in Swindell for a, for a very long period of time. And although our sort of um, motivations are a little bit different, the societal drivers are different. Um, you know, we are still interacting with that landscape in a way that provides societal benefit, just like the people that straighten the river in the first place were. So up on the cliffs and crags, moving away from sheep, which are able to kind of get right up into some of these places, um, swapping them for uh, cattle and ponies, which are much more terrain challenged. We're starting to see a lot of the wildflowers sort of spilling back out into the wildlife, uh, into the landscape again, providing, you know, a huge um, benefit to many, many invertebrates and then to the birds that feed on those invertebrates and onwards up the food chain. If we're to restore horsewater's habitats to their fullest health, we're going to need all the help that we can get. So I accidentally mentioned pine martins earlier on when I was talking about pine flycatchers. Um, but we do hope that pine martins will be back. Um, many studies are now showing that when pine martins um, recolonize an area that has both red and grey squirrels, they have a disproportionately heavy impact on the grey squirrels. They feed on the ground much more than the red squirrels do. Red squirrels and pine martins evolved alongside each other. So red squirrels have, have sort of adapted to, to um, be small enough that they can scamper along very small branches that are far too spindly for the pine martins to follow them. Grey squirrels evolved in North America where there wasn't a pine martin analogue. And so as soon as the pine martins appear, they just the grey squirrels just get absolutely nailed by them. And that reduces the risk of squirrel pox being transferred to red squirrels. So, so to be able to bring a species back that we consciously eradicated, um, which would also benefit one of our most sort of beloved uh, native species in the red squirrel, um, is clearly you know good news all round. Similar story for beavers. We eradicated them. Um, they are slowly starting to return. There's a couple of enclosed um, beaver projects in Cumbria already, one of which is just down the valley from us. Um, at some point, we hope those fences will come down and the beavers will be able to sort of spread out. And a big focus for our work at Horsewater, working with United Utilities, is to try to make the catchment operate as a better filter for water. And that thing that the beaver is sitting on there, which it maintains in perpetuity for free, is effectively a gigantic water filter. So by bringing beavers back, it would be hugely beneficial for United Utilities. It would be hugely beneficial for United Utilities customers because it would kind of help the land to act as a better natural filter and, and reduce the sort of the, the the amount of treatment that would be would be required and it would also be hugely good news for wildlife because many many studies have shown that that beavers are basically kind of little furry biodiversity explosions where their wetlands um return where they maintain them you know water voles benefit a whole range of wildfowl benefit um amphibians reptiles you know the whole ecosystem um seems to depend on having uh, beavers back in the landscape so we are quite enthusiastic about them um, turning up at Oars Water again I hope sometime soon. So although obviously most of what I've been talking to you about has been about wildlife and that is clearly our main focus at Oars Water, people are really important as well. Um, the, you know there are many people that are beneficiaries of the work that we're doing, everybody benefits from land management that uh, locks up more carbon, yes many people that benefit from um, reduced flood risk, but also the people that are doing the work are, are, are benefiting. When, my, when I started at Horsewater, I was one of three full-time employees plus a farm contractor. Um, we're now up to about 18 people working at Horsewater and we have a further seven 
um, working just down the road on a wider um, landscape initiative. So, you know, that is a massive increase in employment in what is really quite a rural and remote part of the world. So the concerns that people sometimes have about depopulation, uh, about, you know, a collapse in the rural economy, we are one of many examples showing that that really doesn't need to be the case and that these alternative approaches can, in fact, be, you know, really very good news for the local economy and the local community. But not everybody, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, is thrilled. Not everybody sees things from like, the same perspective. And and I suppose it's not surprising that, that many of the local farmers would have been nervous about us turning up. You know, we had to be very careful not to disrupt traditional hefting patterns on the on the common. We went to great um, expense and effort to make sure that um, there was there were fences in place before we made changes to our grazing so that we didn't disrupt our neighboring um, neighboring common graziers. Um, but there was objection from some other more surprising quarters as well. And I'd just like to read another little section from the book um, uh, uh, almost to, to finish up the talk. The Lake District, with its constantly evolving farms and an ecosystem full of holes, became a World Heritage Site in 2017. The nomination document that describes the English Lake District World Heritage Site runs to 716 pages. So it's difficult to summarise what the designation really stands for. It talks a lot about beauty, about farming and sheep, especially Herdwick sheep, the Lake District's native breed, beloved of Beatrix Potter. It mentions nature now and again and talks about the Lake District as the birthplace of the conservation movement, though it means landscape conservation, which focuses on preserving the aesthetics of a place rather than nature conservation, which is more concerned with the protection of species and habitats. It celebrates the area's geology and pretty lakeshore villas, its poets and farmers, if you look hard enough, you can find sections that support or oppose almost every possible point of view, but the emphasis on sheep farming is clear. The word sheep appears 365 times, the word flower only three times, farm appears 1052 times, nature 92 times. I'm sure that there are lots of people who care passionately about the designation, but I've not met many of them. Most of the farmers I know are ambivalent. Contrary to what you might expect, World Heritage status doesn't provide them with either funds or protection. The Federation of Cumbria Commoners initially welcomed the designation, having described it as a powerful weapon that puts hill farming centre stage. But it's not clear how that weapon is to be used. A couple of years after the inscription, a delegation from the Lake District World Heritage Site Steering Group came to Nadal Farm to give my RSPB colleagues and me a training session designed to help us understand what being in a World Heritage Site meant for our conservation work at Horswater and elsewhere in the lakes. They talked us through the cultural concepts from the nomination document and the new paperwork we now had to complete to enable the steering group to ensure our activities didn't impact on the World Heritage Site's attributes. In the discussion afterwards, I asked how the RSPB's presence at Horswater was perceived from a World Heritage perspective. I was told that when the application was being prepared for UNESCO, the steering group had been forced to accept that there are a number of warts on the face of a potential World Heritage Site. One of these warts was the RSPB's presence at Horswater. For mine and my colleagues' work to have been described like this was extraordinarily offensive, and the fact that anybody would be prepared to say something so blunt to our faces took my breath away. I asked for clarification, just to make sure I'd heard correctly. It was explained to us that we weren't authentic because we didn't fit the stereotypical profile of family farmers, we were considered second-class citizens. They were effectively saying that the only true stewards of the land in this newly minted World Heritage Site were the Lake District farmers, ideally born and bred here and from farming families, lineages to which my colleagues and I didn't belong. Yet they also worried about the lack of new entrants to farming. It's hard to see how this sort of thinking can end well. So I don't know about you, but I find in moments after a bit of a uh, a disagreement, it's it's the moment you leave the room that you think, oh, if only I'd said that really smart thing, if only I'd had that this brilliant response, or if only I'd slapped them. Um, and it was really that moment, that episode, that um, got me started on writing. I um I went away from that meeting pretty angry, pretty enraged, as you might imagine. Um, and went away and furiously started scribbling down a response that I might have up my sleeve in case similar accusations might be levelled against us in the future. And to start with, the things that I was writing were shouty and cathartic and, you know, certainly not suitable for anybody else's eyes but mine. 
but I worked at it and I realized actually that the process of writing is is a really useful one for reflection to, to you know ask yourself is that really how I feel am I really that angry is there a different way that I could perhaps have that discussion in future and as I wrote I also started to realize that there is this amazing um set of stories intertwining stories that have shaped how Horsewater is today and 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 you know what might happen in the future you know if the if the the reservoir wasn't created if the dam wasn't built and the village that was flooded as a result didn't take place then probably eagles wouldn't have come back it would have been too busy a place for them those eagles have now gone and we're working very hard to see if we might be able to get them back again at some point in the future i also realized as i was writing that the work my colleagues and i are doing at Horswater, whether the world heritage site steering group like it or not um, you know, we are part of Horswater's story now, and the, the things that we're doing will be detectable by, you know, the archaeologists of the future, if you like. So the work that we're doing at Horswater is a long way from complete. Indeed, it, it will never be complete. That's not how nature works. You know, we are simply kind of the stewards of this part of the world um, for the period, for a small period of time. We're trying hard and we hope um, more than anything that if we do our jobs right, that we might make Horsewater a landscape which is fit for eagles again in the future. Thank you very much for listening. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. I'm just going to step in if I may from Andrew. say thank you very much. That was tremendous. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to put to Lee? Uh, Andrew's got one here on the chat, so I'll okay, just answer that. Um, yes, you, yeah, you mentioned that, that, so that's great, yeah. yeah. Uh, you mentioned that our previous agricultural policies led to unexpected consequences, particularly for wildlife. I'm curious to know whether you have thoughts on what unexpected consequences might be now that we're changing to more nature-friendly farming policies. Thanks. Um, yeah, I absolutely do. Um, and there is huge jeopardy that we don't get this right. Um, food production is clearly an important thing we all eat. Um, so we need to really make sure that the nature recovery work that we're doing either integrates with effective food production or replaces it only in the places where farming is incredibly marginal. Um, so in our part of the world, farming is very marginal you know it is very very difficult to grow anything on a wet steep uh cold cumbrian hillside um so you know any of you who are familiar with with the uplands of the uk will will recognize that a lot of land is given over to the production of sheep sheep only produce about two percent of our national calorific intake and yet about 30% of the land is given over to producing them. So that, to my mind, means that the uplands are absolutely the place that can deliver the most nature recovery for the, the least loss of food production. Um, and I'm not suggesting, actually, that we should be replacing uh, food production altogether. I just think we need to think about how we balance food production in the uplands with the production of all those other goods that I talked about, the carbon sequestration and flood risk reduction. So that, you know, that can be done perfectly compatibly with a degree of food production, albeit probably less than typically occurs in many upland areas at the moment. And then in the more productive areas in the lowlands, we need to make sure that we are farming in a sensible way so there is a risk there is an unintended consequence perhaps that we might intensify further some of those places we need to make sure that that doesn't happen because we know that in very intensive models always have knock-on impacts you know the the pesticides always find their way into the watercourse so regenerative farming offers a huge um opportunity to to try to um square that circle if you like you know we can learn from some sort of traditional practices, life, basic things like livestock rotations, you know, um, crop rotations, I should say, whereby you have a period where livestock come in and they provide the fertility and then you have a period of arable again. All of those things that a lot of our forebears actually kind of just did naturally, we can learn from and adapt um, in order to, uh, you know, make sure that we're producing the food that we need in the right places. Um so yeah, I, and another unexpected consequence, which which you might be alluding to, 
um, is the risk that people, uh, farmers, farming tenants particularly, lose um, their tenancies. Uh, there is a lot of money flowing into nature recovery at the moment, and there is a concern that landowners might take land back in hand. They might try to get rid of tenants in order to sort of cash in on that income. And again, that is a risk. Um, and there is a lot of work that needs to be done to make sure that this transition that we're going into that is already starting, in fact, is um, an equitable one and that it works for farming tenants as well as landlords, as well as for wider society. And, you know, I am seeing examples of where that's happening and where it's where uh, where that transition is being done fairly and where farmers are being able to tap into those funding streams. But I'm also seeing examples of where people are not wanting to change and are losing their tenancies or not having their tenancies renewed as a result. And that's difficult for those individual families, of course. Um, but I think everybody everybody needs to change. We are facing an international emergency. And if people don't change, then I think they're going to find themselves unstuck. So, so there's going to be some difficult, there's still a lot of challenges ahead. Uh, Elizabeth, could you tell us some more about the badger hide and how that's positively impacted the horsewater project? I can. Good question. And it allows me to make a brilliant advert as well, doesn't it? So we have this wonderful badger hide uh, that was basically our first foray into um, ecotourism, if you like. Um, so we're very different to a typical RSPB reserve in that we don't have a big visitor centre. We don't have a cafe. We don't have a shop, any of that stuff. But we did want to demonstrate that, um, you know, diversifying an income stream is a really good thing for farmers to do so not just focusing on the livestock production and this is one of the things that um you know people interested in rewilding and ecological restoration often talk about it's that ecotourism is going to be the the sort of the solution um to you know if you move away from farming where is your income going to come from well it's going to come from ecotourism i think that's a bit of an oversimplification but what we found is that um you know the diversification the ecotourism can provide a very important part of a diversified farm business. Um, so our badger hide generates about £10,000 worth of income every year. Um, it costs us about £3,000 to build it. And it's a very simple thing that people just pay to book the hides. They come and they watch the badgers. And often, you know, it's the first time they've ever seen badgers alive. And it's an amazing experience for people. And it's generating this, this, this really valuable income that we can, you know, we obviously use, uh, spend on the conservation work at Horsewater, but we can also use to kind of demonstrate that that diversified income model really, really works. Um, and so, you know, we're not suggesting that every farm should have a badger hide, but it's just that general principle of, you know, we've got a big tourism market in Cumbria and there are lots and lots of different ways to tap into that. Um, Wendy says... Are there opportunities to spread the regenerative farming ideas across other parts of the Lake District uplands? And have you infected other people with your enthusiasm and experience? So I'm not going to claim any credit for having um, influenced lots and lots of other people, but it is happening. You know, there are, uh, you know, absolutely a growing number of people that are doing similar things to us. Um, and we talk to each other and we share our ideas with each other. And some of those are, you know, proper farmers, if you like um and there are also lots of conservation organizations and you know big private estates and things that are leaning into this stuff so it is it is quite exciting actually there is a collective enthusiasm um that is definitely happening i think across the country um but i think there definitely feels like there's quite a nucleus of it in the lake district james rebanks has been hugely helpful in that you know he is obviously a proper farmer in a way that that you know i'm never going to be and the rspb is never going to be um, and his books have have really helped to make it more socially acceptable for many farmers to to talk about nature recovery, to do nature recovery. Um, so he's been yeah hugely hugely influential character. And I know James quite well, and we chat quite a bit. Um, Colin asks, how would you describe your relationship with commoners now compared to when you started? I live just off Dartmoor. Oh dear. Uh, and the relationship between commoners and natural England is to say the least strained and has become more so recently. Yeah. So I think we're in a better position than things. That, I think we're in a better place than Dartmoor is. Um, but it's very, very mixed. Um, you know, there is no 
one size fits all. So we, we're involved with three commons um, at Horswater. One of them, we are effectively the sole commoner now. There's one other commoner and he doesn't exercise his rights. So we've been able to do lots on that one. There's one common um, where the commoners have just dug their heels in and refused to change. Um, we talk to each other and everything is civil. And I think probably they are starting to realise that change is coming and that they're going to they're probably best to lean into it than try to fight against it. And then the third common, they have basically just decided that they are happy to make a massive change, mainly because the financial rewards for doing so are so generous at the moment. But a couple of them, it's a common that's got six active commoners on it. A couple of them are actually really quite excited about, you know, seeing what will happen if they move from sheep to cattle um, and seeing what will happen when they start to plant more scrub and, you know, seeing if, if black grouse will respond positively. And, you know, one of them in, in, in one of the commoners meetings the other day with all of his all of his peers um, said two things that were amazing, said, one, I would get real satisfaction from seeing trees grow um, on the common. And secondly, said, well, even if the sheep come off, we're still going to be farming, aren't we? We're just going to be farming nature instead of farming sheep. Um, and that is the mindset that we need to see happen. So, yeah, I am. I'm quite aware of the challenges that are going on on Dartmoor at the moment. Um, but, you know, everybody needs to keep the faith that change is possible and that, you know, at the end of the day, it is often economics that drives this stuff. And if the government get the offer right, which I feel like they prob are, almost have, um, then I think people people will follow the money and it might be painful for them. Um, but after a while, I hope that they will see that this is just one change of many changes that have been happening you know every few generations um and i suspect at every one of those points of change people find it really really difficult so um yeah stay positive and thanks for all those nice comments um, i'm just going to ask one very small favor to any of you that, that might have read the book um reviews really really help um i'm not about trying to boost sales in order to <laughs> uh to 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 make loads of money or something like that but um you know i wrote the book in order to put a message out um mm. and the more the book can sell the more that message will get out so you know if you have a moment to leave a review on the dreaded amazon or somewhere like that even if you haven't bought it from there um they they do really really help and i'd be really grateful but, um you know, sorry if it feels a bit scuzzy to ask that but yeah thanks all so much for for coming and listening in yeah. Lee, one of the words you used quite a number of times in your talk was opportunity. <clears throat> and, and in fact, when you think about it, in fact, the, the, the opportunity in a way to start writing the book came from that unexpected um, irritation that you felt after that meeting that you described. And I think your book is, is so good as, as well at showing how opportunities occur, even when circumstances at times might look rather unpromising. And you're the kind of guy who who can see those opportunities and and lead and inspire other people to to do things with them, uh, and I think that's no small part of of you know what you bring to all of this. It it is as people have been saying in their messages to you, really uplifting and really encouraging. And I think on behalf of everybody, thank you, and we wish you well with the next stages. And we look forward to another book perhaps someday down the line. <laughs> so, thanks very much, Barry. Thanks all.